yeah, as Ms. Karen just said, um, my name is Morgan. I'm an undergraduate student at USF. I work in Dr. Herbert's lab um, where we do a lot of geoscience research. And today I will be presenting to you Aging Florida's horse conch, Triplopusis giganteus, using isotopes, spherochronology, morphology, and laser ablation. Now, I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with the horse conchs, but I just have some fast facts for everybody, make sure we're all on the same page. The horse conch can be found down the southeastern United States, across Florida, through the Gulf of Mexico, up to the Yucatan Peninsula. And just because I think this is interesting, I have some kind of historical facts for human interactions with the horse conch. So the Calusa tribe was a Native American tribe that used to live in the southern part of Florida, the southwestern part of Florida. You can see on that picture I have attached to the slide. Now, a lot of the sites where the Calusa tribe used to live, there's often found the shells like you see in the middle picture on this slide. It's thought that the Calusa tribe would hollow out the shells, stick a stick through them, and they could use the horse conch either as a weapon or a tool. They could use the thick side as a hammer, or if they sharpen the lip, they could use it kind of as a blade. Now, fast forward to today's human interaction with horse conchs, it's not as cool. I think that this is kind of a gnarly picture, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, but this was found on a blog post of somebody who was hunting and harvesting the horse conchs for their meat. Now, this is kind of interesting because somebody on the blog post asked about the legality of hunting and fishing for a horse conch meat. And somebody rep replied that as long as you have a fishing license, that it's legal. This really represents a problem when we talk about the unregulated harvesting of the horse conchs, which we will talk a little bit more uh, about later. But on the note of harvesting and hunting, horse conchs do some of this on their own. Those first two pictures are pictures of horse conchs eating crabs, which kind of seems like it would be impossible, but it's a cool picture. And then that third picture all the way to the right is gonna be a picture of a horse conch eating a smaller snail. Now, personally, um, I didn't really know how a horse conch would eat. I couldn't really picture it, so I Googled it, as one does. And um, like Ms. Claire said earlier, the power of YouTube is very strong nowadays. Um, so I found this on YouTube. Uh, this one was posted by BBC, but there's a bunch of other videos posted by National Geographic and stuff. So I have a video that I will play for you now. It's pretty cool, right? I thought it was interesting that horse conch just chases down that smaller snail and just devours it. It's pretty cool. Um, but the real reason that I showed you all this video and the pictures on the slide before it is because it represents the role of the horse conch as an apex predator in its environment. An apex predator, you can kind of think of as the top of the food chain. So another great example of an apex predator would be a great white shark. Um, my professor, Dr. Herbert, likes to call the horse conch the T-Rex of the snails, which I thought was hilarious and that I would share with you all. But yeah, this moves us in to why we kind of started this experiment or the basis for this experiment. We have reason to believe that the horse conchs are under threat of unsustainable harvesting. So basically, we don't know if they're being taken out of their environment at faster rates than they can replenish their populations. Now, it would be devastating to see the horse conch go extinct not only because they have intrinsic value as animals and cool looking animals at that, but also because they have that role as an apex predator in their environment, they, are, they have a very important role in sustaining the balance of the entire ecosystem. And when an apex predator is removed from an ecosystem, things kind of tend to go out of whack for that environment, which isn't good. So in order to create laws to conserve and regulate the harvesting of horse conchs, Legislators need to know certain life history traits. So a life history trait could include how old the organisms usually live, how fast they grow, what age they reach maturity, what age they reach, uh, they reach sexual maturity, and things like, do horse conchs have 10 offspring every six months? Do they have one offspring their whole entire life? All these are really important when we're talking about making conservation for these animals. And we used um, science, obviously, to understand the age of these organisms. So the methods that we used were isotopes, sclerochronology, laser ablation, and morphology. Now, before I go into all those methods in depth, 
I kind of want to explain some of the scientific assumptions that we use or that we kind of knew about in order to use the methods that I'm going to go over. So calcium carbonate is the main makeup of the shell. And in calcium carbonate is oxygen. Now, funny thing about oxygen is they can exist as isotopes. You can think of, the, of an isotope as like a variation. So pictured on the screen is O16 and O18. You see those everywhere. Those are just variations or those oxygen isotopes. So we know that those heavier oxygen 18 isotopes, when it's summertime and the temperature of the water is higher, there's gonna be more energy and it's harder for those shells to hold on to those heavier oxygen isotopes, those um, oxygen 18 isotopes. So because we know this, we know that during certain points in the growth of the shell, there's gonna be more or less of those heavier um, isotopes. This brings us into our first method that we use, which is isotope sclerochronology. This method is very similar to dendrochronology, which if you've never heard of it, it's the study of aging a tree. Basically how they do this is they cut the tree in half, they count the rings on the inside of the tree, and from there they can get an age estimate of how old that tree is. Obviously our lovely horse conks don't grow in the same way that a tree does, where a tree grows wider and taller. Our horse conks grow in a spiral fashion. So while we totally could cut a horse conch in half <laughs> and count the rings, we probably won't get very far if we do that. So rather than counting physically, we have to count chemically. And how we do this is you can see Nicole Seiden. She is the one taking the drill to the shell right now. She's a graduate student in Dr. Herbert's lab. The reason that she's taking the drill to the outside of the shell is because when she drills the outside of the shell, we get a powder that comes off of it. This powder is a great representative sample of the entire shell. So when we measure the chemistry of samples and we take a bunch of samples all along the spiral of the shell, we can create an overall profile of the chemistry of the shell. So this is the data that we have for the isotope square chronology. <laughs> this graph reads left to right. So the horizontal axis, that zero to 100 number you see is gonna be the measurements that we took from the top or the apex of the shell. And as the shell spiral goes out, the graph moves to the right. So that 900 to 1000 number you see, those measurements are gonna be closer to the lip. That vertical or Y axis is just gonna be the ratio of those heavier oxygen isotopes to those lighter oxygen isotopes. Now, hopefully you can also see on the graph that there are clear peaks and valleys those peaks correspond to summer seasons and those valleys correspond to winter seasons. And we have those labeled on the graph. So where you see S1, that's summer one, where you see W1 is winter one, and then we go to summer two, winter two, all the way to summer 11 and winter 11. Now, the same way that I've lived through 20 uh, summers and 20 winters because I'm 20 years old, we can say that we know this horse conch has lived through 11 summers and 11 winters, so is at least 11 years old. Now, I would like to direct your attention to the right side of the graph near the picture of the horse conch. To me, it kind of looks like somebody took <laughs> the end of the graph and just smushed it together. But basically, you can't really see those peaks and valleys that you can see in the rest of the graph. And this is where our second method comes in. So it's called laser ablation. Rather than using a drill to get the sample of the shell, we use a laser. This provides a much higher resolution understanding of the chemistry of the shell. The way it works is rather than drilling the outside of the shell, we take a cross section or a cutout of the shell, which you can see in that picture he's holding. If he just puts that down into the cutout of the shell, it's gonna fit like a glove. So I have a video for you all. Full disclosure, this video is from another laser method that we tried to use. Um, it didn't end up working out, but the reason I included it is one, because it's really cool looking, I enjoy it. Um, but it also provides a really good kind of understanding of how the laser analysis works. So I'll go ahead and play it for you. What you're gonna see is the left screen, that white light is the laser hitting the plate that the cutout of the shell is on. When that laser moves to the surface of the shell, you're gonna see something really cool happen. So I'll play that now. It's really fast. If you missed it, that's okay, I'm gonna replay it. But just so that way you understand what's happening, that white light, again, is the laser that's hitting the plate of the shell. Once that laser hits the surface of the shell, it's gonna emit a plasma. So 
the same way that we can measure the powder that comes off the drill when we do isotope scoring chronology, we can measure the chemicals that are in that plasma that are a result of the laser hitting the shell. So I'll play it for you one more time. Pretty cool. The data that we have for laser ablation, this graph has a lot going on. It's honestly pretty in my opinion. Now this graph does not read like the last graph I showed you. This graph reads from right to left. So the right side is gonna be closer to the top of the shell and the left side is gonna be closer to the lip of the shell. But that Y axis is still the ratio of the amount of chemicals that we have present. That black line that you see is the data from isotope square chronology. You can see from this graph alone that that data is not as detailed as the data that we get from laser ablation. So all those blue dots you see are the values that we get from laser ablation. And that red line is just a running average or the line of best fit for those blue dots. So while you can see kind of more seasons, you don't really see any hidden years, which is what we thought we would see with laser ablation. But that doesn't mean that this method was a waste of time. Everything you do in science has to be like super repeatable, super verified, and you have to be super confident in your answer. And while we're not 100% done sorting through the laser ablation data, what we do know is that it backs up the data that we got from the isotope sclerochronology. And this moves us into our third and final method, which is called morphology. Morphology, okay, so the horse conch has this operculum, which you can kind of think of as a trap door uh, between the animal that's living inside the shell and the outside environment. Obviously this trap door or the operculum is gonna have to grow at the same rate as the rest of the shell, or else it would kind of be useless. You know, if you have like a one meter size shell and a trap door that's like this big, it probably won't do a whole bunch of good. So because we know that this operculum is gonna grow at the same rate as the rest of the shell, we can count the growth breaks on the shell to get an age estimate of the animal. So that's what we've done here. You can kind of see we have Y1, Y2, all the way to Y14. What we think is that this operculum goes to a shell that's at least 14 years old. Now this might seem like a less sciencey method than the methods that I talked about earlier, but this is a super accessible way for people who don't have lasers or hand drills handy on them to get an age, to get an age estimate of the horse gong. So people like collectors or fisher folk or whoever might want to harvest a horse conch, if they can just pick it up and count the growth lines in the operculum to get an age estimate, that's much more reasonable, much less invasive, and much more accessible, which is why we included this method in the presentation. So yeah. Those were our three methods that we've used so far. Um, when we combine the results that we got from all three, we are provided with three conclusions. The first of which is that these animals are not 80 to 100 year lived. We thought that they might be based on um, a fish and wildlife researcher's guess, based on the size of the horse conchs and other molluscan growth rates. We thought that they could be 80 to 100 year lived. Thankfully, they kind of max out at around 15 years old. That doesn't sound like it would be a good thing, but when we're talking about the recovery time for populations being harvested, it's much easier for a population to bounce back if the individuals only live to 15 years versus if the individuals live to like 80, 90 to 100 years. This brings us into our second conclusion, which is the relationship between the age of the animal and the growth or the size of the shell. So we weren't sure like kind of the development of the horse conch, we weren't sure if, for instance, humans, from the time we're born until right after puberty, we grow pretty steadily. And then in our mid twenties, after we hit puberty, we just kind of plateau. We weren't sure if horse conchs exhibited the same behavior. Turns out they don't. There's a pretty linear relationship between how old the organism is and how big the size of their shell is. So pretty much as long as that animal is still alive, they're gonna keep trucking out more and more shell. What this means is when you find a shell that's like a meter long, it's always going to be older than a horse conch that can fit in the size of the palm of my hand, for instance. And now our third and final conclusion is that the carbon that is biostored in these animals can tell us a lot about the reproductive cycle. Like I said earlier, the calcium carbonate is the main component in the makeup of the shell. In the same way that oxygen levels can vary in the shell based on environmental conditions, 
carbon does as well. But carbon also does something a little bit different around the time that the horse conks are reproducing. Full disclosure, we don't know exactly how it varies, like if there's more or less carbon or if it's before, during, or after reproduction. We just know that something wonky happens and um, we use this conclusion as a springboard into our next life history trait experiment, which um, looks pretty promising. So I think that's it. <laughs> I had a great time. Thank you so much for letting me present here today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, if any of you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to address those now. Um, I got accepted to a master's program at Clemson in the fall. So ask me again in two years and I'll probably have an answer for you, but I'm gonna finish grad school first before I make any decisions. I know that um, what I was describing to you where the oxygen isotopes have a harder time holding on when the temperatures increase, we call that fractionation. There's also another um, variation in the elements of the shell that's called Raleigh distribution. It's definitely Raleigh something, I kind of forgot. Um, I know that both of those are gonna affect the uh, chemical makeup of the shell, but besides that, I don't really know. I kind of don't have an answer for you. Um, I know acidification, it would have to be really acidic for it to affect the shell. The animal could be affected by a much um, lower dose of acidification, but because that shell is made from hardy calcium carbonate, it's much harder to affect those bonds in a big way, at least. We were donated to record-sized horse conch shells, which kind of helped guide what exactly, what animal we were gonna do an experiment on. But the graduate student, Nikki, that I mentioned earlier, her, the basis for her master's degree is kind of studying, or I think she's getting her PhD now. But either way, it's studying biodiversity in the oceans and trying to affect policy in order to create like conservation laws and things like that. So this was a great avenue in order for us to do that, especially because the horse conch's role as an apex predator is like super important. So it just kind of worked out. Not really. Um, that's actually one of the first things that we saw. Isotope story chronology. Nikki and Dr. Herbert did that, I think, before I was even at USF. So I know that they are still working through trying to find different ways to identify and isolate those wonky things that happen to carbon. But it's kind of hard because carbon makes up such a big part of the shell and just a bunch of other like chemical traits about carbon, it can make it kind of hard to determine what exactly is going on with the reproduction, especially because we're using dead specimens. So it would really be our best guess. Like if we could do a lifelong study of the horse conch, it'd probably be much easier, but we can't really do that, especially if we have to shoot a laser at the shell or drill it. We can't really do that with a live specimen either. So there's just a bunch of scientific parameters that kind of keep us from knowing exactly how the carbon is affected by reproduction right now. That's kind of the best answer I have for you. <laughs> I very much agree personally. Um, I was going to mention that in the presentation, but when I went over it with Dr. Herbert, he was like, the way it's coming off makes it sounds like we don't have it down to an exact science. Somebody like me doesn't have a trained eye. Here, I can go back. Somebody like me doesn't have a trained eye to identify those ridges. If you see the middle picture, they have those black dots that align with the growth breaks, which we outlined in white for this slide. Somebody like Dr. Herbert would be able to tell you much more exactly how to identify. We have the that darker if you can see like right where that Y8 is, we have that darker, larger span, that short white span, and then it cuts off and starts the darker. Again, I'm pretty sure that that's the marker for each year, but I'm gonna have to agree, it's still, this method is still kind of a work in progress when we solidify it, because somebody like me, my analysis probably wouldn't be super reliable, at least in comparison to somebody like Dr. Herbert's if we were to use the operculum alone. I would assume yes, it's gonna, that happens for every animal though. Um, not having food availability and nutrition is gonna slow or um, even stop the development of some animals. We see that in humans even. Um, 
for children who are malnourished, they don't develop the same way as uh, children who are like overly nourished, for instance. So that's going to happen with every animal, which wouldn't exclude the horse con. You know? We can see our money is being used very well. Oh, Thank you so much, Morgan. That was excellent. Thank you so much. I really had a great time.